Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Good evening. and welcome to this uh, lecture on the TUI uh, series. I thank you for finding your way upstairs. Uh, we got um, uh, displaced. We will be back downstairs in the auditorium on next uh, Tuesday evening. So thank you for making the journey upstairs with us this year. First of all, I want to thank you again for finding your uh, way up here and remind you that there are two more lectures in this series next week and the week after that. For those of you who are here in previous weeks, I welcome you back. For those of you who may be here for the first time, uh, again, I, uh, I'm sure you're going to find an enjoyable evening tonight. The lecture series is Jerusalem, Jesus, and Jihad, End Time Scenarios in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in this year's edition of the Walter and Mary Tui Lectures in Interreligious Studies. These lectures are supported and funded by Walter and Mary Tui, and as I've said before, Mr. Tui was a chief executive officer of CNO, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, and given his interest in interreligious studies, he funded this uh, uh, program and making it one of the first ecumenically funded, ecumenical funded uh, uh, lecture series at American universities. So we are very grateful to the Tuis for their support and very happy to be able to carry on this legacy of engaging in dialogue with other religious traditions. Our lecture tonight, and again for the next two weeks and for the past three weeks, is Dr. David Barr, Professor of Religion at Wright State University. Dr. Barr received his PhD from Florida State. He taught in Florida, at Florida A&M University, University of Northern Ohio, and for several years, many years, taught at Wright State University. He is widely published in books, articles, reviews, and dozens of lectures and scholarly meetings. And all this by way of saying, I'm sure you'll enjoy what he has to say. And also, as many of you know, you need to be alert to his quiet humor, which well, I'm sure will emerge tonight. Uh, last week, Dr. <coughs> Barr discussed the origins and development of the concept of an evil being. In a sense, he was asking, where in the devil did the devil come from? Tonight, he will continue the series by looking at the origins of the idea of holy war and how this idea has impacted, on the, have impacted the tradition uh, of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The title of tonight's lecture is Jihad for All, Holy War and Religious Violence. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Barr. There'll be no humor tonight. <laughs> Just like the last lecture? Oh. With friends like this. It was a hot summer day in 1948. A little Bedouin boy was wandering through the hills south of Jerusalem, looking for a lost goat, he says. He idly threw a stone up into one of the caves in the uh, hillside, as he was accustomed to doing on uh, different occasions, seeing if maybe his goat had wandered in there. But instead of a goat, he heard something break. And being a little boy, he decided to find out what. He climbed up the rugged hillside to one of the caves, and inside he found a jar had been broken, and in the jar was a very old manuscript, a, a uh, <coughs> scroll of uh, ancient heritage. Thinking it might be valuable, he took it home to his father. His father was sure it was valuable, so he started cutting it into pieces. Oh, no. Well, if, if one is valuable, how much more might three be? Uh, he couldn't sell the whole thing uh, on the, in the marketplace, but he could sell pieces of it. Uh, well, the stories of how the uh, scroll was uh, rediscovered the various pieces put back together, how the uh, cave was located, how other scrolls were found in the cave, how other caves were located with more and more scrolls. All is an exciting uh, story worthy of a James Bond movie, but will not be our agenda for tonight. However, if you want to read that story, a new book by John Collins, the biography of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, is a very entertaining and a helpful uh, place to do that. Trouble with pages, they stick together. 
The scrolls were eventually called the Dead Sea Scrolls. They've been extraordinarily important to scholars. For one thing, they contain uh, numerous copies of biblical uh, manuscript, of manuscripts of biblical books that are a thousand years older than anything we had before. Now, you can imagine that people get excited over little tiny squiggles on a page, would get excited to have a manuscript now a thousand years older that they can check against the manuscripts they've always been using. So that, that was one exciting thing. Another thing is that in addition to the uh, scrolls, we had for the first time a look at a first century Jewish group unfiltered by later Jewish and Christian uh, historiography. As Christians and Jews tend to remember the past according to their traditions and to see the past in their own terms. Here we have people that left us their own past. And they left us a sizable deposit, not just one or two manuscripts that we could trace to the same people, but a whole bevy of scrolls that we could uh, begin to reconstruct the life of the community. These scrolls describe the life and teaching of a small group of celibate men, something that shocks us quite a bit, because celibacy is not a normal part of Jewish religiosity. Probably Essenes, living in a communal, almost monk-like existence, <clears throat> cut off from the world in the deserted hills about a mile northwest of the, of the Dead Sea, hence the name. They weren't found in the Dead Sea, just near there. The uh, scrolls show them to be extremely dedicated. It took three years to become a full member of the community, the final step of which was to uh, donate all your property to the community and you had to pass a test each year in order to uh, continue making progress. They were extremely pious, they divided their day into work and study and prayer, and they were extremely end times oriented. They uh, seemed like a relatively harmless group, but they imagined their lives to be a constant warfare. One of the uh, <coughs> scrolls that were found in that first cave is technically called 1QM, 1Q for the first cave of Qumran, but it's called uh, more fully the War Scroll, and it describes uh, vividly the life that they uh, uh, were living as a war, an ongoing battle, a 40 years war, between the Sons of Light, themselves, and the Sons of Darkness, everybody else. To imagine this war to last 40 years, and it would go back and forth with different uh, uh, sides winning different days, until finally in the seven such uh, interchange, God would intervene and destroy all the wicked. The sons of Japheth, for those of you who are familiar with your uh, biblical uh, genealogies, uh, Japheth was one of the sons of Noah and is uh, attributed to the uh, European area. So the, the northerners and the Romans, Katim is a code word for Rome in uh, many of these kinds of writings, will be utterly destroyed. And notice that near the end of the uh, thing that it's the God will fight against the whole multitude of Belial. That's what we were talking about last week. Is that there's a spiritual force that's being uh, fought against here, not, not simply the Romans or other outside groups. And the priest will give a signal on the trumpet and the battle formations. Uh, this scroll is uh, really quite remarkable in that it, it's like a uh, Roman battle manual that shows how you blow different sounds for different uh, attacks and retreats and how the gates of war open, that is the front lines, parts of the next line can come through and uh, all of this in highly symbolic terms winding up with the uh, notion that the camps of the Katim, that is the Roman soldiers uh, army camps, will be completely destroyed. Now one of the ironies of history is that the, this group would be routed by the Roman army on its way to Jerusalem down a rebellion by other zealots who had declared war, an actual war on Rome, stopped paying their taxes and tried to defend the city against the might of Rome. Uh, both of them failed. Uh, probably it was the uh, approaching army, we think, that caused them to put their scrolls in these caves and leave them. We don't know why they never came back, but we're glad that they didn't, because they left the scrolls for us to enjoy uh, endless dissertations from. <coughs> In, th in this instance, both those who waited quietly to fight a war of the spirit and those who took up arms against Rome met the same result. They were destroyed by the power of Rome. Now, a refugee from this war, or so we think, 
emigrated to Asia Minor, what today we call Turkey, where he became a prominent anti-Roman voice. He eventually published his uh, collection of visions, in a, which contains a major cycle of battles against Rome and against the other enemies of God, Gog and Magog, and the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, this man's name was John, and his writing is known as the Apocalypse of John, or more simply as the Book of Revelation. And a major part of that work is a series of, of battles between Satan and his agents. Satan portrayed as a great red dragon, and the uh, 144,000 uh, pure men of the uh, Lamb's army. Uh, perhaps it's only natural to imagine that a time of peace and justice can only emerge from a period of war. It doesn't seem intuitive to me, but that's the, what we have found in all three of the uh, end time scenarios from these uh, religions. We do, however, uh, tend to speak in such metaphors. We talk about defeating evil, or overcoming corruption, or fighting temptation. But perhaps the roots are deeper than simply metaphor or natural cause and effect. Adela Yarbrough Collins has shown that both the idea of a cosmic battle and the actual sequence of events in John's War correspond to the oldest stories we know, stretching back some 4,000 years, the Babylonian creation myth, known as the Enuma Elish. It's a rather long story. Found on seven stone tablets. I'm hoping these are right side up. I don't have any idea if they are not. <laughs> Cuneiform being one of, the, one of the many languages I didn't master. Uh, 150 lines of text on each. And it would take us a considerable time to work our way through it, which we will avoid doing tonight. Crucial for our concerns is that it imagines that the beginning of creation was founded on a, by a cosmic battle, the same sort of trans-historical battle that all three religions imagine will recreate the world at the end. So perhaps a brief synopsis will do. Its main characters and the story uh, the story is part imagination, uh, part observance of nature, of the cycle of nature, and part myth, or perhaps all myth. There's a large cast of characters, which we don't need to bother with, the only three that we'll need to uh, pay attention to. Um, <coughs> action revolves around Marduk, the chief of Babylonian deity, and a primal pair called Apsu and Tiamat, who are also symbolic of fresh water and salt water. Just as, the, as life thrives at the confluence of the river and the ocean, so the confluence of these two brought forth all life on earth, beginning with the gods. The various gods, the gods of the watery, watery, watery netherworld, say that three times, and the gods of the land. The story begins, and I quote, When on high no name had been given to heaven, nor below was the netherworld called by name, primeval Apsu was the progenitor, and Matrix Tiamat was, the, was she who bore them all. They were mingling their waters together. When no god at all had been brought forth, none called by name, no destinies ordained, then there were formed the gods within these two." Unquote. But the story soon takes a darker turn. The gods, as newborns will, became boisterous and offensive, upsetting Tiamat. But she was indulgent, we are told. She does nothing. Her husband is less patient. Apsu shouts his displeasure. And here he sounds like a father who's working the night shift to me. Their behavior is noisome to me. By day I have no rest. At night I do not sleep. I wish to put an end to that behavior. To do away with it. Let the silence reign that we may sleep. But Tiamat again is indulgent. She refuses. Shall we put an end to what we have formed, she asks. But Apsu persists in his hostility. Led on by one of his advisors, he begins to plot the gods' destruction. But such an enterprise cannot remain a secret. The gods learn of it. They work a charm on him, put him to sleep, and eventually kill him. And again, Tiamat does nothing. Tiamat, after all, is the goddess of chaos. Why should she do anything? But the gods continue their boisterous behavior. They invent the four winds, which churn the ocean back and forth. And that, of course, is Tiamat herself. Finally, Members of her court convince her that she must take action. She declares war. She creates monsters to fight on her side, fierce dragons. 
She chooses a general and assembles her army. Now the gods are terrified. The bar of chaos is enormous. They can formulate no pan plans. They have no hero. Each blames the other for their predicament. Finally, Marduk comes toward, forward and offers to fight Tiamat, but only on the condition that the other gods give him part of their powers and they recognize him as the high god now and when, this is, when he has gained the victory. They all agree. Well, the battle is richly described in the text with the gods and monsters all about, but Marduk ignores the armies and manages to get Tiamat to agree to single combat. Blaming her for the murder of her children, she is enraged, she charges at him, Marduk, in part a storm god, brings a huge wind against her. She opens her mouth to swallow the wind, but the wind is so intense she cannot hold it until she is inflated. Marduk then shoots an arrow into her belly. Quote, it cut her innards, it pierced her heart. He subdued her and snuffed out her life. Her army is decimated, her corpse is hacked in two, and half of it used to create the earth, the other half to form the sky. Marduk then proceeds to organize the universe, putting the stars and the planets in their places. The calendar is established, the seasons are fixed. Babylon is created as the earthly counterpart to the abode of the gods. Humans are created from the blood of the defeated to be the servants of the gods. A feast and the fixing of destinies follows. There's much more, rather esoteric, but that's enough for our purposes. And at this point you're probably asking, well, what is your purpose? What I hope to do is to understand the mythic dimension of war. How do we justify a war? Now, if we as moderns look at rational argument based on natural law, what we call a just war theory. That is, can a war be defended on a rational basis using rational and uh, natural law uh, arguments? But we also rely on myths and metaphors which we, by which we devalue the enemy and scrub our motives of self-interest. Without our intervention, we say, chaos would reign. Fighting chaos is our sacred duty, and violence used in the execution of that duty is righteous violence. I sometimes call this the Lone Ranger myth. And I mean by that the Lone Ranger of my youth, not the one of the new movies who seems to be quite a different character. The Lone Ranger, as you recall, was the disinterested man of uh, high moral standing who with no thought of benefit to himself, would look after the oppressed, would ride in, save the day, use his silver bullet, fix things, and ride off without any reward or even a thank you. He used righteous violence to solve the problem. Uh, sort of like the United States riding to the rescue of the helpless female called Kuwait to rescue her from that oppressor, Saddam Hussein. That is, we rely on myth and metaphor to justify even rational decisions to go to war. This myth of sacred violence, holy violence, is still alive after 4,000 years and permeates Christian, Jewish, and Muslim thinking about the end of days. The enemy, the enemy will always be a monster, or as the Iranian leadership refers, the great Satan. Note how much is shared between the myth and the end times thinking. The degeneration of the age, the emergence of chaos, the approaching end of days, with a new world established by a holy war, utilizing sacred violence, with a promise of a return to paradise. The myth of the beginning and the myth of the end, or as my learned colleagues say, protology is eschatology. The beginning is the ending. And while the myth of Tiamat is nowhere detailed in the biblical tradition, it is clearly appropriated by some to explain the Israelite history, both directly and indirectly. The author of Job makes explicit use of the myth, though he calls Tiamat, Tiamat by a different name. And Isaiah recalls the ancient myth, urging God to awake and perform once again the mighty duties as he had in the past, when he cut Rahab in pieces and pierced the dragon. Now the name change from Tiamat to Rahab is probably comes by way of Canaanite mythology, which takes the same myth <clears throat> but gives the characters different names. And just as clear, later writers <coughs> felt no compunction about it, identifying with such elements uh, as in this ancient mythology, as what I call picking up the pieces of Tiamat and making something new again. 
So in the story of the Exodus, God cuts the sea in two with a great wind so that Israel can pass through safely. And the psalmist uses the figure to praise God. Making sure I'm having the right slide. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. And although the Genesis creation story makes no direct connection with this myth, there's some intriguing relationships. Notice how the creation story begins with chaos, formless, empty, dark. And here too, creation is the process of bringing order, the days of the week, out of chaos, the chaotic ocean, the deep, to home. And here too, the instrument of, of God is a wind. Could also be translated spirit. Here too, the waters above are separated from the waters below by an overarching canopy. And in both stories, God rests when his creation is complete. Further similarities emerge when we consider that the full narrative that the creation stories set in motion, the creation stories are actually the introductory unit of a longer narrative that includes Genesis 1 through 11, sometimes called a primeval narrative. In this narrative, creation results in the failure of Adam and Eve, the near obliteration of the human race in the Great Flood, and the fracturing of the human community in the story of the Tower of Babel. Now, I do not know a delicate way to put this, so I'll just say it. These are myths of origins, not unlike the creation stories of other religions, not unlike the Enuma Elish. They are not intended to tell us what happened in the past. They paint a picture of what it means to be a human in the present and what can be expected in the future. Somehow the modern struggle between religious and scientific worldviews in these stories has taken on an aura of facticity that reduces them to quaint and irrelevant misconceptions. And the stars are not hung on the canopy of the sky like Christmas or ornaments on a decoration, although that is a charming concept. We can learn many things from these stories, but science is not one of them. What we have instead is a portrayal of the creation of order out of chaos without a war. Notice how we proceed in the the creation accounts to create first the idea, the form, and then the things that fill the form. So that the days are not correspond one, two, three, they correspond one, four, two, five, three, six, as the form is created, order is created, and then the things that make up that order are added to it, culminating in the idealized day of rest, a fitting image of paradise in an agrarian society. But this idyllic balance does not last. Taken as myth, the primeval narrative seeks to explain the present chaotic state of the world. You no doubt know the stories, which take us to the, in stages from the perfectly ordered world of the seven-day creation to the Tower of Babel, where each human family goes its own way, unable to communicate with its neighbor. First, Adam and Eve violate the rules of the garden, inevitably choosing knowledge over obedience. Then the two fight, the two sons fight over who best pleases God, and leading one to murder the other, which seems to me is somehow parabolic of the end time stories of these various traditions, where each imagines the other being obliterated. Things degenerate fast. God begins to sound a little like Apsu when he decides that he is fed up with this uh, creation of his. He's sorry that he's made them, and he's going to put an end to it. The ensuing flood obliterates all but one human family and a few representative animals, but the peace is short-lived. Noah discovers wine and curses one of his sons and things go down the from there. Once again, humanity multiplies and now develops an ill-conceived plan to build a tower up to heaven, which incidentally is almost certainly the Tower of Marduk at Babylon, which uh, imitated the city of the gods in the city of humanity putting the temple of Marduk at the top where you ascend to the, to the temple of God, of God in the sky, as it were. In the biblical story, God is alarmed at the prospect that they might build such a tower, confuses their languages so that each speaks a different language, and failing to understand each other, the building project is abandoned from order to chaos. Now, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all share these uh, stories, but they mean different things from them. For Jews, the story of uh, 
primeval narrative illustrates how God tried to work with the whole world but found no help there. And so he abandons that, stra that strategy and chooses one people, a chosen people, Israel, who becomes the focus of his attention because the very next chapter is the call of Abraham. So in the Jewish view, order is restored through the chosen people. For Christians, these stories tell of human depravity and the need for redemption. The story of Noah becomes a uh, story of preservation, not destruction. An archetype of baptism in 1 Peter 3.20 there's eight persons who are saved through the water in the Noah story. Order is restored through the church, more specifically through the rituals of the church. For Muslims, Noah is the prototypical prophet whose primary task is not to save himself by building the ark, but rather to save his people by preaching to them. Quran uh, 7.59 reads, We sent Noah to his people and he said, O oh, my people, worship God. You have no other gods but him. I fear for your punishment of a dreadful day. Order is restored through God's revelation made concrete in the traditions of the Muslim community. Interesting how we can all read the same story and find quite different meanings in it, I think. While the myth of the triumph of order over chaos might seem like a one-time event, it's not. As anyone with kids or dogs know, or chaos is always at the door. Myths are generally accompanied by rituals, Rituals that enact the story and allow the story to become actual. In this case, in the, of the Enuma Elish, we're uh, lucky to have a fairly clear record of what that ritual was. It's called the New Year's Festival, because the New Year is a, is a symbol of the, of the creation of order out of chaos. It's called the uh, Akitu Festival. It lasted 12 days. And most briefly, at the beginning of days, things begin to fall apart. On day five, the king goes to the temple of Marduk where he is insulted by the priest. He's stripped of his crown and his jewels. He is slapped hard and is locked up. The king has lost his throne. Chaos reigns. Marduk returns to his own temple where he finds a similar situation where the gods of the underworld have assembled to take him prisoner. He remains prisoner for three days. And then <coughs> other gods arrive. He gains his freedom. He begins the process of reasserting order and uh, has his royal marriage to the goddess Ishtar, fixing of destinies and the enthronement of the king. One can see here the underlying agricultural metaphor of the death and rebirth of, of the plant world, which is, of course, one of the great mysteries of life. But here, biology is becoming sociology, or perhaps politics. That is, the myth explains our human struggle with chaos and order. And the ritual allows for the overcoming of chaos and the establishment of a new order and the creation of a whole new year, a new epoch, if you will. Now, I've spent considerable time, you may have noticed, laying out this background because I think it helps us understand the war mythology embedded in the end-time scenarios of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In my title for tonight, I have signified this mythology with the word jihad. Now, true confessions. I did this in part because it starts with J, and I like alliteration. <laughs> Jerusalem, Jesus, and J. But uh, more important, understanding jihad is essential for understanding all end-time scenarios. Now, the root meaning of jihad is striving, with the implication that one is striving on behalf of Islam. It does not, on the one hand, mean holy war, as some polemicists would say, nor, on the other hand, does it simply mean trying to be a better person, as some apologists would say. Its original meaning must be seen in the context of the situation of early Islam, which was under military threat at, and at the time. Muhammad had relocated to Medina, established the first Muslim community, and he was under attack by the other tribes who did not want him to gain such power. It was a, their clear duty of Muslims to strive to protect the community, he taught. And in that situation, it certainly included military action. Even so, Muslim thinkers have carefully circumscribed the invocation of, of jihad with formal criteria. Uh, formal criteria include things like there must be a formal announcement of jihad and why it's being declared. Terms for a resolution of the uh, controversy must be pr propounded before hostilities begin. Uh, careful regard must be given to non-combatants and their property. 
respect for the enemy dead, and restrictions on the type of warfare allowed. Notice that this is not holy war, if by holy war we mean a war declared by God in which God participates. Actually, the term holy war is a relatively modern invention. It goes back only to 1901, according to the things I read, um, in a book published uh, in German called Heilige, Heilige Krieg, uh, which was about the wars in the Old Testament, wars in which God was the main actor. Now, it is often said that Islam conquered by the sword. And that is true as far as it goes. How else does one conquer? How did the Byzantines conquer? How did the Europeans conquer the, the Americas? How did the Crusaders conquer? In fact, according to David Cook, the classical meaning of jihad is a direct response to the experience of the Crusades. We must be clear, however, that Islam conquered by the sword, it did not convert by the sword. Rather than believe that the, <clears throat> rather they believe that the final hour is approaching, that God has sent His revelation to His prophet Muhammad, revealing how the one is to live both individually and in community. The time to establish such a community was short. Thus, the urgency of the early believers, who within 15 years of Muhammad's death had conquered Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and Persia, often without real resistance, which they attributed to divine aid. And as you can see, the enthusiasm maintained itself, and the uh, ability of Islam to uh, <coughs> conquer these territories was facilitated by the urgency of the end time, the final hour that was believed to be at hand, before which uh, things must be set right. Now, once conquered, special considerations were given to the peoples of the book, generally thought to mean Christians and Jews, who would suffer some social constraints, such as extra taxes, but not forced conversion. In fact, the uh, Jews in Spain, under Muslim rule, experienced more freedom than they did under any Christian rule, resulting in a flourishing Jewish civilization. So what do we make of jihad? Well, let's start with the notion that words don't mean what the dictionary says they mean. The dictionary says what they mean because of the way people use them. Within Islam today, there are two attempts to redefine the, the meaning of the word jihad. On the one hand, there are those who pick up the distinction between, in a hadith, where Muhammad congratulates people from turning from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad, by which he means from the, from the fight against external foes to the fight against one's internal, uh, uh, internal evil inclinations, a much greater struggle than the struggle against an external enemy. So the jihad here begins to take the notion of striving to be a better person. This is well within the meaning of the word jihad, and is to my mind an admirable endeavor, though it would be historically inaccurate to suggest that this is all that the word ever meant. At the other extreme are those Muslims who define jihad as the necessity of all true Muslims to take up arms against those who would dominate Muslim lands, and even against those Muslim leaders who would pervert Islam. I have neither the time nor the expertise to trace the history of these movements. We can say with some certainty, however, that recent events, beginning with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and their expulsion, uh, the, the overthrow of the Shah of Iran, the Israeli in invasion of Lebanon, stationing of troops in Saudi Arabia, and the invasion of Iraq, and such events, that these events have allowed some <coughs> to try to redefine the meaning of the word jihad. Such a redefinition involves two new ideas. First, the jihad is not simply a war, but it is an ongoing struggle. This is derived from a hadith which Muhammad is reported to have said, a group of my community will continue fighting for the truth, victorious over those who, have, who oppose them, until the last of the fights is against the Antichrist. It also introduces a, a uh, vigorous use of the Dajjal tradition. That is, it sees the Antichrist, the, the Dajjal, in the actions of their opponents. Only they make the new move, it's not simply a person. It can be an institution, it can be Israel, it can be the United States, or Zionism, or the Jewish conspiracy to control the world, or other such things. Now I cannot say that the leaders of these movements are motivated by end times thinking, but it is clear to me 
that they use such thinking in justifying their actions. Now, even those Muslims who define jihad to include military action generally oppose this new definition. To be legitimate, jihad must be waged by the state in response to military attack and sanctioned by the whole community, none of which is true in the current situation. Nor does Islam permit the killing of other Muslims in the name of jihad, and it forbids the practice of suicide. So we have martyrs, not suicide bombers. And perhaps most important, everything we know about the Muslim world suggests that the vast majority of Muslims reject this new definition. So let me try to draw together what I've been trying to do here. In my first lecture, I tried to emphasize the diversity within each of these traditions and to indicate that while the end time scenario might be widely believed across a broad spectrum of the faithful, they were that these end time beliefs were functional only for a small percentage of each tradition. Mostly those on the conservative side of the, of the ledger and mostly those who felt ill at ease in the present world for one reason or another. The second lecture attempted to show the origins of end-time thinking and to show that within the common framework of Jewish, Christian, and Muslim <coughs> scenarios, the meaning of the end differed significantly for the three traditions. For Jews, the primary meaning of the end times was the regathering of Israel, the end of exile, which I try to capture in the word Jerusalem. For Christians, on the other hand, the End times refers to the second coming, for they focus on the completion of the story of Jesus, the finishing the work of the Messiah and overcoming evil, something that Jesus failed to do. And so for Christians, the end times is centers on Jesus. Muslims understand the approaching end times as a striving for the establishment of a Muslim society, jihad. So the overall title, Jerusalem, Jesus, and Jihad, points in the first instance to the, to the distinctive ideas of each tradition. Distinctive, but not unique. That is, Jerusalem is important to Christians and Muslims as well. Muslims and Christians both believe in the second coming of Jesus, and although Jews don't believe in the second coming of Jesus, they posit the coming of two messiahs, the first of which will die, and the second of which will be victorious. All three traditions imagine that the striving, which they portray as a war against the Antichrist, is their duty. The third lecture last week attempted to explain the Antichrist tradition by exploring the origins of Satan, Iblis, first as a sort of lesser god and then as a manifestation as in, in a human agent who will bring about the end times. <coughs> the Antichrist, the Dajjal, the Amulet, it is this cosmic dimension of evil that requires a cosmic solution, the final battle between good and evil. Just so, the men of Qumran, men of the Dead Sea Scrolls, engaged in the, the powers of darkness, striving to keep the law perfectly, expecting that if they should ever keep the law perfectly, the Messiah would come and usher in the kingdom of God, purifying Jerusalem and reuniting the holy community. Still, it gives me pause that all three traditions imagine that the coming of the just and peaceful society is achieved through some act of righteous violence. At best, such a belief can lead to oppression and coercion. At worst, it can entail catastrophic, catastrophic consequences. So on that high note, I would like to bring my lecture to a close and say that that is my topic for next week, actually, when we'll be talking about attempts to manifest the kingdom of God in various historical movements. So with that, I would like to invite some questions, comments, funny remarks. Sir. Yeah, have scholars found any relationship to, uh, it seems that the, the scrolls fall between what would be the Jewish Torah and the Bible. Do they find any influence from the Jewish Torah in these uh, scrolls, or the scrolls in any way influence writings in the Bible? Copies of every biblical, every uh, Tanakh book, except uh, Esther, are found uh, among the scrolls. In the scrolls? In the scrolls, yes. So they accept them as, they work with the general corpus of scripture that other Jews do. But uh, have they presumed anyhow that these scrolls were influenced by Jewish writing? 
Some of them are attempts to rewrite some of the Jewish history, yes. Um, but they're, they're, they're certainly Jewish. They're just, a, they're just a form of Judaism that we never imagined would exist uh, based on what we know about rabbinic Judaism. Dead Sea Scrolls found? 1948. So about uh, 60 years ago. Um, they were written between sometime between around 200 BCE and 50 CE, as far as we can tell. Where do they live now? They just completely disappeared from history. <laughs> they walked off stage and we've never been able to find them. Sir. Did you say that jihad needs to be formally ordered to be conducted? Is that right? That's what I'm told Muslims say officially. Okay. Yes. But the, the attempt of the, uh, I, don't, I don't have a good name for uh, the people like Osama bin Laden who uh, tried to redefine the meaning of jihad. Uh, in a, as an ongoing struggle rather than as a war. And to, and to see that as the duty of every Muslim, for anybody that threatens Muslim land, or Muslim rulers who pervert Islam, you must uh, struggle violently, if necessary, to overcome them. That's, a, that's an attempt to redefine the meaning of jihad. And uh, whether it will be successful or not, it certainly is successful, with a very small group of people, which happen to number hundreds of thousands, because Islam is a religion of a million people to start with. So a very small percentage of the people are convinced of this, but it's enough to cause havoc uh, in, in uh, our world. Sir? Are there other Jewish sects that uh, were strongly in times also, or were the Essenes one of the few? Um, the uh, end times orientation of the period seems to be rather pervasive. Uh, now the, the people who belonged officially to different sects was a very small percentage of the population, probably less than 10%. So the ordinary people uh, learned from those people, but uh, would like ordinary people to be more influenced by the spirit of the age than by any particular teaching. And as near as we can tell, um, End times expectation was rather widespread in Judaism at the time of the birth of Christianity and, re and resulting in, in Christianity and, and Judaism and then Islam all becoming religions of end time orientation. Which is, uh, it didn't have to be so, I think, but it turned out to be. Yes? Who founded the Essenes? Uh, the short answer to that is, is the teacher of righteousness. The long answer is we don't have any idea who that is. But well, we have some ideas. Um, one theory is that, uh, you remember Antiochus Epiphanes and, this, and the persecution of the Jews and the Maccabees rising, rising up in rebellion against them? When the Maccabees won, they didn't turn the temple over to the normal priestly line. They kept the high priesthood for themselves, so they were not in the right line to be a high priest. It is believed that that caused some people who appreciated the Zedekite uh, priesthood to withdraw from the temple and enter a period of uncertainty and wandering where finally a teacher of righteousness appears and draws them together in this communion. But we don't uh, say that that is uh, part evidence and part imagination. Maybe equal parts. <coughs> yes. Oh, sir. Question? What, uh, what do we think about, or what we, what we learned about the relationship between Enuma Elish and the creation myths in Genesis? Is there a, I can't picture somebody looking at Enuma Elish, I don't believe that, I read something else. But what, uh, do we have any idea how they relate to one another? Well, I think our mistake is that we think things relate by text. Whereas the ancient world was almost entirely an oral culture. And so these myths traveled from people to people. The gods' names would change. Uh, but, the, but the myth and rituals would maintain themselves. And so I suspect that these myths were quite uh, viable in the context into which the Jews came when they came into Canaan. And as you, if you just read through the text a little bit, uh, 
below the surface you can see that the religion in that period is a blending of Canaanite and, and Yahwistic traditions. So I suspect that, that a lot of people knew this mythology, and uh, Isaiah can simply refer to it offhand, you know, that you pierced Rahab. Uh, it must have been fairly well known to people. But in terms of direct influence, I, other than the general influence of order out of chaos, I can't point to uh, specific things in the in the enumeration. Now, in the flood story, you can find enormous parallels with Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh, but that's a different. Is it peculiar to Genesis that the war is taken away from Israel? The slain. I think so. That only occurred to me uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, that uh, that might be a unique feature of that tradition. And I don't have a ready explanation for it. It would be a preferred it would be a preferred model for a modern secular person like myself if we could get order without uh, having to go through the war first. Yes, you mentioned that the three religions uh, all had different readings of the flood narrative and the consequent calling of Abram and how, what, what, how those functioned in history, and I wondered if you thought that those different readings were mutually exclusive. Um, yes. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> it might be possible to uh, do some creative cross-religion uh, uh, dialogue on such subjects, but I think that the the interpretation of the of the whole Hebrew scriptures depends as much on who's doing the interpreting and what their worldview and values are as it does on the scriptures themselves. That they, they can take the same story, the same set of stories, the same collection of stories, and come to radically different conclusions about what they mean based on the worldview that they hold when they approach them. It's amazing what the human mind is capable of. I don't want to keep you beyond your uh, patience, but if there's any final question, this is the time to do it. Otherwise, come up here and we'll talk privately. Can we express our appreciation? <laughs> we'll, be back. we'll be back downstairs next Tuesday. Hope you join us again. Thank you.